figuring out how you redevelop a set of uh, routine to do what you just described when the whole world's routine was upended has been a fascinating challenge the last few years. Welcome everyone to the Sports Business Podcast. Today we have the CEO of Palmerex, well, many Canadians know them as Weather Network, Sam Sebastian. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks, Tim. Very great to have you and uh, or great to be here and, um, and great to meet you recently and looking forward to it. Absolutely. So um, Sam, you are currently CEO of Palmerex. Formerly, you were the managing director at Google in Canada, which is yep. a, a pretty big shift from Google to Palmerix. I'm sure we'll get into that in the podcast as well. Yep. You're also board of directors for Tennis Canada, and you were a Big Ten champion in tennis at Ohio State. What a story. long time ago! Yeah, yeah. A long time ago. <laughs> so let's start there. How did how did it all start for you? How did the tennis uh, you know get into your life at a young age, and how did you go to Ohio State and and all the wonderful things after that? Yeah. Um, so I, I grew up in, in Columbus, Ohio, in the Midwest, in the U.S. I'm American. I moved up to Canada about eight years ago, um, but my roots were in the U.S. And uh, my dad was a football player and a tennis player. Uh, and at a young age, he realized I was going to be kind of skinny and scrawny. So football it would probably not be my sport. So he, he kind of edged me towards tennis. And uh, I started playing pretty seriously as early as 10, 11, 12. And it was just a in a great sport, and and he worked uh, closely with me, and I slowly but surely got better. Well, I was on the court probably two or three hours a day, every day with him, um, and then I just kind of joined the junior circuit and traveled around the U.S. all the way through the juniors um, and a little bit international, and just loved the sport, loved competing, uh, and. And it was a differentiator for me, right? I had something different uh, yeah. in, uh, that, that, that could give me confidence and in and, and all the various other kind of, yeah. uh, you know, work ethic, discipline, everything else that comes along with it. And, um, and then I, it, I was able to leverage that or use that in order to pay for my education. So my dad was a school teacher. We didn't have a ton of money growing up. We lived in a, in a um, you know, kind of Midwest um, uh, city, but we just, we didn't, you know, it wasn't going to be a ton of opportunities unless I could make my own. And so tennis allowed yeah. me to, um, to do that. And I got a scholarship and it, it enabled me to, to, to get a great education. Um, but also to continue my playing career and to do it at home. Uh, so my folks could see me play, my friends could see me play. But, and, and I tried the tour a little bit out of, out of school, um, but I knew I was never gonna be a, a pro player. And even if I had wanted to do that when I was younger, it was just gonna be too hard. And I, and I really liked academics and, and, yeah. and had a sense that I might eventually wanna go into the business world. So it, it frankly became kind of a tool for me to, uh, to, to learn a ton along the way and have a ton of fun, pay for my education, and then kind of push me out into the real world. Uh, but boy, for 10 years or so, it was just a, a great experience, um, um, yeah. in, you know, individually as well as on teams. Yeah, for me, it was in my, I think, fourth, starting my fourth year when I realized that the pro career in the CFL, uh, one, it wasn't that long, it was about two years, and two, not a lot of people make it. Yeah. Um, so that's when I got serious about, you know what, I, I, I am at a good school, I'm getting an education. Um, was that also kind of similar for you as you got through your education? You're like, you know what, let me start focusing on the business side of things now. Or were you always, you had the plan in your first year that tennis is for a university, and, but you also have to make sure you're focusing on, on business. Yeah, I knew... Listen, I had been playing tennis since I was 10 years old, three hours a day. So to a certain extent, I, that was, I was your life. All, yeah, it was my yeah. life, but I was almost done. By the time I got to university and was enjoying playing tennis, yeah. part of me was looking forward to maybe just retiring from that side of my life and coming coming up with all these new things that I could do. We, I, I moved to Chicago right out of school and um, and just had a whole new set of experiences that didn't rely on, well, make sure I don't get hurt, make sure I'm training, all of that. And so it, it just kind of naturally worked, frankly. My last, I think my last match was against Michigan in the Big Tens, and it just felt like I'm done. 
And so it, you know, maybe that some, some of that was mental because I was kind of preparing for, uh, for that, that evolution and that transition, but it never was this huge, oh my God, I'm never going to make it in the pros. And this is a, I'm grieving. It just kind of happened naturally as, as things went, yeah. went through. And then my experience at Ohio state was one where we were good. We weren't so good that, that I didn't have enough time for my studies. The the coach there was great. He could give me plenty of time because he knew I was really focused on academics that I wasn't, I didn't have to be on the court three or four hours a day because we weren't top five in the country. They are now, they're an incredible team now, but we were probably top 20, top 30. And um, so I, I had the space that I needed to focus on what was going to come after university. Which is a big part to your coach as well. So I think leadership perspective, you, you want to be able, whether it's business or in sports, um, at least in my experience, is you know, work, playing for a great leader, uh, a great coach, and working for a great leader is probably more important than the company that you're oh, working sure. at. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Like you, you know, people leave um, companies because of their boss, and yeah. and oftentimes I've found uh, if you developed a good rapport with folks over time in business or almost in anything folks will follow you, right? Uh, a sign of a great leader is followership. Folks will will seek you out wherever you wind up um, going uh, to work for you again or work yeah. with you again. And the same is, is true in sports. And and I think that, that, that when I hire, um, I always, I, I wouldn't say I necessarily favor it, but just because of my own experience and understanding how athletics, team sports, all those assets it built over time. Uh, I just, I, I probably put a little premium in it in my head when I'm looking at folks who have that background because I know the sacrifice, but yeah. also the different capabilities they've built up that they're going to be able to leverage in, in the real world, right? On that note, um, when you have a lot of lot to do, so playing tennis, any sport in university is almost a full-time job, plus you have academics. Plus, you want to make sure you have a social life, right? Now, you're doing a lot more than the average student. How do you make sure? So what are, what are some of the, the principles, some of the, the skills that you've learned in Ohio State um, that you're still using today when, you know, for example, the pandemic, when yeah. things went yeah. crashing down? Well, so I think different folks are built differently. I am built in a way that if I have a lot going on and I learned probably through tennis and, and other things, I learned how to time manage, but I am better, get more done, have more of an edge and more confident. If I, the more I have going on when I had uh, four classes at Ohio state, I would get better grades in those four classes than in, than if I had two classes and I didn't have an eight o'clock or something like that, just because it forces you to get organized, be efficient with your time. And so I think tennis and, and academics and just the balance I had, and I, and I still, again, I was a good tennis player, but it wasn't like top 10 in the country. So it wasn't like I was down at Nick Boletari doing tennis all day long and I couldn't have a social life. So I also had a social life growing up, but that, all those legs of the stool, if they, if I was busy in all of them, I was better in all of them. And so I just recognized that in myself. And so I wasn't afraid to pack my, my schedule because I knew I would actually be better for myself yeah. and others that I was working around. And, and the same goes through to now. I was just telling my wife a couple weeks back that at the end of last year, I just started my feeling I was I just was losing my own edge running the company. I just, and, and it was because I, you had all this adrenaline rush of running a company through the pandemic. And we had done that. I've been working from my home for two years. I still haven't been back in the office. And the first year, year and a half, it was just the adrenaline. And I had all these things going on, but then everything just started to settle in. And I would have a rhythm. I wouldn't yeah. talk to anyone. And I just wasn't any good because I, I didn't have I didn't have that edge. I didn't have a bunch of things packed. I wasn't traveling personally or professionally. And so this last couple of months, I've just basically been force fitting things in, in order to get that edge back to make sure that I was, um, that I was busy again, both, both mentally kind of challenging yeah. as well as just physically. And as the world has opened up, it's allowed me to do some of that. But I think, you know, and again, the hard part in the thing that I learned, I think how to deal with it growing up playing tennis was how do you ensure that you don't burn yourself out in the, in yeah. the meantime, you, 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 you want to 
be pushing yourself, but to the point that you can handle it. If it gets too much and you start getting so stressed out that you're bad for your family, your, your team or your company, then it doesn't work anymore. But, but over time, I think you find that blend that, that works well for you and, yep. you know, and then you manage it appropriately. It's, it's, it's like doing a lot of different things that you're passionate about, but knowing what activities that are, are the most important per each one of those buckets. Yeah, and that give you energy as you get older, you realize how important energy and energy yep. consumption is. Uh, and I think many of us are learning this through the pandemic. I'm generally more of an introvert. And so actually getting out and doing a dinner or doing small talk or networking actually takes a ton of energy from me because I don't, it's not natural. Yep. Um, and, but I've also learned that not connecting with people on a daily basis that I'm comfortable with through work gives me energy and I've lost that through the pandemic. So it, it, it's interesting looking inward over the last couple of years and trying to manage my own energy level um, because to get the blend right of all those legs of the stool, mm -hmm. energy is extremely important, especially as you get older and you just you just lose energy. Um, you've got to make sure you find the, the right blend that, that can provide you the energy you need when yep. you know you're going to get sapped in a few other parts of your life. So as an executive, what are some things you do personally, Sam, that allow you to be your best self day in and day out? Whether it's a routine, a ritual, diet, what are the, some of your top three or four things you do every single day that allow you to uh, really execute? Sleep is most important for me. So I track my sleep and my physical activity uh, on a nightly basis, just because I like, I, I like that. The, when you see data, when you see information, it tends yeah. to change some behavior. I, I'm not you too a, forceful. You yeah, I, well, you know, I do it pretty old school. I just have a spreadsheet and I, and I know when I go to bed, I fall asleep nice. right when I hit the pillow. And so I know exactly kind of, and so, and I track that on an annual basis over the last four or five years. And just the mechanism of doing that, I've increased my sleep from like six and a half hours to seven and a half hours over three or four years. And, and that, that habit, as you get older is so important. I think it's probably important whenever, but sleep to me is extremely important. So yeah. steady, steady sleep during the week. Um, I don't drink during the week. Uh, Cause it just kind of, I, 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 when I was working at Google, I would travel all the time. And if you have a couple of drinks during dinner with a customer, it just, it adds up and it just saps mm -hmm. you a bit. So I stopped that over the last four or five years. During COVID, I've been very conscious of steps and activity. I don't, I don't, I, I was playing tennis again, uh, but when COVID hit, everything shut down. So I didn't really have that opportunity. Um, but, but I'm always trying to out, be outside, just walking around to get a bit of the fresh air as well as, um, uh, as well as activity. And then I'm a morning guy. So I, I, I get up early and I start the first hour, hour and a half of my day just reading. Um, uh, mostly probably just catching up on everything that's going on in the world. But I've found that, you know, if, if every morning I do that and I kind of settle myself in, then when I go down the hall to my office, uh, I'm kind of mentally prepared. I've, I've slept well. Um, I've got kind of regular eating habits and I've exercised the day before. I've settled myself in because I know what's going on in the world. And then boom, like from seven on, I can get my work done, but then also be present even in a remote fashion for all the employees and all my team throughout the day. You're, I think everything you're saying can be summed up as almost preparation yep. before um, you actually start to execute. Right. And, um, and I think a lot of, a lot of times, especially when I was younger, I would just show up to, let's say a meeting or, or even in football practice in my first year. And I realized that the people that are doing well, some of the older guys, they actually spend time preparing for these meetings, even though we think we just show up and that's the actual work. The work happens oh, outside okay. yeah. of this, just like it's a hundred. I mean, that, like, that's what you learn as an athlete, right? Yeah. Um, the actual game becomes muscle memory. So it's mm -hmm. all of the reps you put in place. And, and tennis is the perfect example. You every day I hit 3000 tennis balls. And so your, your forehand isn't just something that magically happens during a match. It has been ingrained because you put in all the time. 
uh, and then you've practiced for all the scenarios and then you're basically just activating or applying everything you've prepared for 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 hours on the court and the same is exactly true for for business um and you get better at over time uh you know i used to prepare for presentations for hours before i gave them now i prepare for presentations for minutes because um, but i'm always preparing so there's always that phase yeah. before um something important uh because you know once once the lights are on and once you're in that meeting then you have to activate the muscle memory but then you also have to be present enough that you are reading the room you're under just like in a match you, yeah. you can see how your customer or your um competitor is is acting and you can react to it but if you don't have to think about all the other stuff that you could have prepared for before then that's done then it's all just in the moment uh, yeah. act, uh analysis of what's going on in the environment that you then activate everything you prepared for Yes, there is a study where all the small decisions that we make, no matter how big or small, they all deplete our glucose levels or willpower. So when you start to think about the smallest of things, such as what to eat today, what to wear, um, you actually are depleting yourself of the power you need to make actual decisions in a business. So what you're saying is to automate them, the smaller decisions, get so good at it that you can do them without thinking about it so that you are keeping your yourself free yep. or the big curveballs that come your way it's a it's a great point and it's and it's it's not easy over time you get in a rhythm and it, and it just becomes like you said a ritual uh, but what's been so interesting is the past two years has thrown everyone off of mm -hmm. their ritual and so you've had to and my personal experience was that um the, the 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 biggest the, the biggest milestone in my professional career has been the last two years I, I I've, I've enjoyed it the most it's been terrifying it's been anxiety ridden um but the honor and the ability and the responsibility of running a company through covid um you'll like it's just it's a badge of honor and and yeah. I've loved every minute of it even though it's been exasperating but but you have had to develop a whole new set of rituals in this environment when all like there's all this uncertainty and you've had to draw on resilience um, to get you through not only for yourself and your family and your kids but then for 500 employees right because they're mm -hmm. staring at you every week when you're connecting with them on an all hands and then trying to see how you're reacting because if you're scared and you're quiet and you're not out there then they just take it as oh boy this is not going to go well yeah so yeah. um but so figuring out how you how you redevelop a set of uh routine to do what you just described when the whole world's routine was upended has been a fascinating challenge the last few years yeah so let's let's actually talk about that what was it like for you to be that moment when I think it was exactly two years ago, a little more than maybe two years yeah. a week ago. What was that like That's for right. you? And and how did you actually you know build your strategy? How do you change direction? How do you get the team to believe that hey, we have a plan in place? Yeah. Well, so it's interesting when I um, when I was at Google, there was a there was a tradition where every Friday the company would get together and and um, just talk about the future of the company, answer questions. Yeah. They did it out of California and then it expanded via video conference all over the world. Uh, and I did it every Friday out of Canada for our team. Um, I tried to bring the same tradition to Pelmerex when I started and everyone was like, well, what are we going to talk about every week? You know, you know, no, we'll, we'll do this once or twice a year. And I was like, no, trust me, it'll make sense. And but never folks just didn't really gravitate to it. We wound up doing it once a month or so. When the pandemic hit, um, we set up a Friday call and we've had a weekly all hands for the last two years, that same time, 930 every Friday morning, because the employees demand it, want yeah. it, are um, are engaging with it because they needed to hear from me and they wanted to hear from me. And now it's just, it, now it's a new tradition. But it was a combination of two things when I first talked to the company after that first week. The first was I was just honest with them. I was like, I don't know, I don't know what how this is going to go. Uh, and our customers are freaking out, um, but we will figure it out. 
And so I transitioned from some authenticity to say yep. like, this is scary as shit. And we've never seen anything like this. And I don't know if this was the last one week or one year. And then I transitioned to, but listen, the last two or three years, we've built the muscles to make, to handle this. Mm -hmm. um, here's my experience as a leader. I'm built for this moment. Like, I'm not going to let you down. I guarantee it. Um, I'm going to, I'll be here and we're going to get through this thing together. So it was a combination of those two messages. One authenticity, you can't fake, you can't fake and say, oh, you know, this is a global pandemic. We've been here before we can figure this out. Like <laughs> yeah. no one knew what was going on, but at the same time, you have to make sure you balance that authenticity and connection with confidence to say, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we have the team and you have my commitment that we will get through it. And that balance, I think, worked. And and many folks say to me now that that just a couple of those comments to say that I was built for this and that I've got you guys and you folks yeah. um, gave them the confidence to say, okay, now I can put my anxieties aside. Let me focus on my family uh, and I'll get them right. But then the work stuff, we've got a leader that's plugged in and who understands how hard it's going to be, but he's going to be there. And that I think was, um, that's how I handled it. And, and looking back on it, I'm yeah. super proud of that because I think it worked. Great point, right? It's, it's at the end of the day, I think if we are faking as leaders that we got it all figured out, um, that actually backfires because at the end of the day, yeah. you're human and you don't have it figured out. And in today's world, everything's so connected. People will figure out that you're not, um, you know, that there's something off here. Um, and the second thing I think that teams really look for is for somebody to provide them direction and to say, hey, listen, we got a plan together. Um, how how it comes later, but it's almost about the why. Yeah. And, and that, hey, listen, I got you, you got me. We're not going to let each other down, um, which is great to see. And and I think the results speak for themselves. Right? You guys have done pretty well over the past Yeah, yeah, years. no, we're, yeah. I'm super proud. I mean, it's a, an amazing team effort and the employees just have stepped up so tremendously. Um, and yeah, again, like I said, it's the, the, the proudest, business moment of my life mm -hmm. uh, was the last couple of years and how we've responded. Uh, and sure, we've made some mistakes along the way. And we, you know, maybe we do a few things differently, but not much. And, um, and, and what I told the team recently, I sent an email to our, our people leaders. And you could, I mean, many of our folks are struggling, right? It's just been a long time. But my, my point to them was, the muscles we've built around resilience the last two years, uh, you're going to leverage those, especially you young leaders, like I'm towards the end of my career. Um, but some of these young leaders who have had to deal with this for themselves and their teams, they've built up these resilience capabilities. They're going to leverage for the rest of their career. Yep. And it is a huge set of assets that will get them through so many tough jams in the future that it doesn't feel like it now you're tired you're mentally strained but you know this is a silver lining you're, you are going to draw upon these last two years for the next 20 in your leadership career uh and you know so just kind of take that and help that maybe balance out how how tough it's been at the same time yeah it, it's uh it's, it's almost like you have to work out to break yourself down so you can get stronger and it's almost a workout for some of these younger leaders where if I've been through the pandemic and I've come out on it on top and I've learned from a leader like Sam, I'm sure I'll be fine because things that we're going to see are probably not going to be as bad as a pandemic. Yeah. Uh, and even if it is another pandemic, at least we got a playbook of what to do and what not to do. And, and I think from a leadership perspective, I remember when I got the, the big job in Canada to run the Canadian operation for Google, um, I had interviewed for the similar job in Australia about a year prior. And the reason I didn't get the job, I lost out in the finals, was the, um, the management said, listen, you haven't had a huge setback yet that you've shown you could get through. The leaders that we need at the highest level at Google are ones who, who failed and came back because the next 10 years of business, you're gonna fail a ton. Like it is, it is just such an uncertain future in the world. And we are gonna have so many setbacks that we need leaders that are resilient who have failed and come back. And 
for, I, I didn't fail on purpose, but the couple of years following, I had some tough years. I had to reorganize some things. I got through it. So then when I interviewed for the Canadian role, they were like, all right, you're ready because you showed how fast you responded to a crisis. And you're going to have many of those in the future. You're going to learn much more from your mistakes. My dad always told me that you learn a ton more from your losses than your wins, mm -hmm. but you have to learn from them. You have to show how you've gotten through it. And that that's just a leadership requirement now when we work in such an uncertain world with, uh, you know, all this global geopolitical risk, everything else. There are there's been more major issues that I've had to deal with in the last two years as a leader than in my previous 30. Uh, and it's probably going to be more like that than less so going forward. And so resilience yeah. just becomes an important leadership trait. And failure is inevitable and failure should be encouraged, especially yeah. in, in today's environment when we don't know what's going to work. How do you, and I think I know the answer, but how do you, how do you rebound from failure? How do you, what do you do? Well, I, it, you get better at it over time. Like I was saying before, um, the, it took me a few, it took me 12 months or so to come back from a pretty big setback at Google. And when I've seen similar setbacks since, it takes me less time to react. Mm -hmm. So, so some of it is just experience, right? Like when, and, and as I'm, as I try to lead younger leaders, and, and they're so ambitious and they want to get to the next level. You know, some of my narrative to them is, listen, you're really, really good, but you're just young. You, you haven't had that many at bats yet. You haven't had a loss. You haven't had, you just, you don't have the experience that someone 10 years on does. And until you are 10 years further and you understand and appreciate that, ex that experience factor, you, you can't, you just can't appreciate it. And so some of this is just, you got to make a lot of mistakes. You got to have a lot of bats you, and the time it takes for you to respond to those mistakes, to rush to a solution, to move quickly. Uh, you just learn that over time. So some of it is just experience. Um, some of it is you got to have the support system around you to get you through it. Um, and so that's where my wife, my family, my team is ex extremely uh, important. And you also need and sometimes I've had it, sometimes I've not. You have to have the venue of those around you, the company that you work, the team that you're on, that that have that similar philosophy of making a mistake it, uh, will develop you. It's not the worst thing. There are companies I've worked at or clients I've worked at where folks are afraid to do something because they're afraid to make a mistake. Lots nothing, oh, there's nothing worse because everyone's walking on eggshells. No one has confidence. You're not... You, you don't have an edge, you're not pushing yourself. Uh, and that's what I, I learned a lot of that at Google because they, they, they wanted you to make mistakes because we were operating in new spaces that no one had defined. They wanted you to fail fast, but they weren't afraid of you failing and then quickly moving on. And so some of it also is the environment you work within. And if you're lucky enough to be a leader to set an environment, you need and want, in my opinion, to set an environment where folks have um, have that full capability to to put themselves out there take big swings miss and if they do then get right back on it and 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 figure out what went wrong and go in a different direction but when you're constantly second guessing because you're afraid to make a mistake you just won't you just won't be any good I mean that that's something you learn as an athlete too if you're confident yeah it's all the difference in the world if you're second guessing and you're not playing at your best you're not in the zone it's 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 all the difference in the world and when you are in the zone you do make a mistake you your next play you're back up in the huddle yeah you're back up right and you're like okay that's fine it's okay i got this you brush it off right yeah. but when you're not in that mental state you you think about it you um it just it doesn't leave you but when you're in the zone you're exactly right you forget my dad always said son zero zero is the most important every time you walk up to the service line zero zero you're starting brand new whether you're up five oh or down five oh it doesn't matter the current point it's zero zero and then that just set me to a point where i wasn't worrying about all the outside factors i could just be in the zone i could play in the yeah. moment and the same is true in life you can't control the past can't control the future you just have to be in the moment at zero zero 
And, and being in the moment zero zero also allows you to deal with your bias that what worked for me in, th in the past will still work for me in the future, which is not the case anymore. So almost having a fresh start allows you to say, yes, I've done well so far, but my strategy moving forward has to be based off of what's in front of me, what's around me and what I need to do. What worked for me it's before true. will not work anymore. Yeah, no, pattern recognition is important. So yeah. what you've done in the past can inform yeah. the future, but especially these days in in business and, mm -hmm. and probably in life, you know, we're getting thrown just <laughs> we're getting thrown the kitchen sink every other week. There's every just something week. huge yeah. going on. And so you can't plan for that, but but you can you can get yourself in the right state, right? Whether yeah. it's confidence or yeah. living in the moment or the preparation for how to respond uh and the in the in the mental um position that okay well i'm going to try something but if it doesn't work that's okay then i can quickly pivot mm -hmm. and we'll try something else like that's a that's a requirement these days yeah. in in life and in business for sure so my coach would always say read and react don't guess yeah read, read the play and react and go and the next time exactly. read again and go um don't try to guess it don't try to you know they do things that you think worked are you going to miss the gap every time it's true yeah um sam what is the most important thing for other executives today uh, coming out of COVID that they should be focusing on? I've said it a couple of times, but I think authenticity as a leader is the most important skill to have these days. So um, especially in a world that I think will be a hybrid and potentially more mm -hmm. remote world than in the past, um, you, you, you have, in my opinion, a leader has to connect with their team. And we've got great young people that are super smart and extremely talented and they can do great work. And so you don't need to be managing with a leash. You can manage with a kite. You just let, you have to set some direction and you let folks thrive. But in, unless they feel connected to you, they, um, they, you will not get the most out of them. The, the, the benefit of operating in athletics and on a team and in business is you realize the best teams that you're on. And, and there's nothing like being on a great team where everyone knows exactly their role and you all play together perfectly. Like it doesn't happen that often in life that, you're, that, that that comes together. But once you've seen it once, you always wanna get it. And the times that I've been operating as either part or leading the best teams I've ever been on was when everyone was connected to one another, they trusted one another, they had the psychological safety to speak up and say something's not right, even to the leader. And you only build that through creating an authentic, connected, vulnerable, safe space with the folks you work with. Uh, and so I just think that skill is, yeah. is going to be so much more in demand in the future because, uh, I mean, it always was in the past, but it was just, I don't, I just don't think enough folks did it. And I think I'm seeing it more now. It's always worked for me, either on teams or working under leaders that I respected and, and hopefully I apply now. But I think that's the most important thing for leadership going forward. 100% agree. It's uh, it's people over strategy. Yeah. Yeah, at the end of the day. It's a, it's a little bit of both. Like I, I, yeah. I, I agree with you. I think um, culture, will will it's it's a little bit of both uh and i've realized that now more than ever as uh, as this first time ceo for the last four and a half years is strategy is important because if you're not playing uh if you're not if you're not running the right play or playing in the right space and playing to win um it all, it doesn't matter as much uh, that you have a great team that comes that comes together. Uh, so you have to have a little bit of both. I still yep. think if if you have a great strategy but you have a shitty team and no one trusts each other, you're, you're done. not getting anywhere. Yeah. Uh, if you have a great team and trust each other, you can probably figure out various different strategies and pivot in case things go wrong. When you can combine the two, a solid strategy that's well thought out, and you have a game plan. Uh, coupled with a team that trusts one another, I mean, you can you can pretty Powerhouse. much do anything. Powerhouse. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Sam, how can uh, everybody watching, listening, learn more about Pomerix, what you guys do in the B two B space, and get in touch with you? 
Well, uh, listen, you're welcome to work, uh, reach out on Twitter or LinkedIn, Sam Sebastian. Um, you know, if, if, if you're in Canada or anywhere around the world, download the app. It's the best weather app in the, in the world. Uh, the weather network or Metro media, if you're French speaking, um, and you know, listen, I, 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 the, the thing that I've enjoyed the most in my career, I'm 50, almost 51. And I've recognized gives me the most energy is, um, sharing my experience uh, with with others that are either just starting out or, or managing through many of the issues I did when I was in my 20s or 30s or 40s. So, um, you know, doing these types of things or mentoring others within my company or outside uh, is is the thing I love. I'll make space for it all day long because I learn from from those folks as well as uh, hopefully I'm imparting some wisdom as well. So, um, so, so connect with me. Uh, and if I can be of service at any point, I'm happy to, um, but mostly, um, you know, just, just, you know, the great Woody Hayes, just pay it forward. So as, as you're, yeah. you're sharing many of these great ideas and, and getting your podcast out there uh, and talking to leaders, as folks hear those lessons and, and, and apply them themselves, then, it, the whole world scales with better leadership if then you pay those things forward uh, and then the folks working under you are seeing those that that authenticity that vulnerability that's that psychological safety working and then we're just going to have great leaders all over the place love it pay it forward pay it forward sam thank you so much for sharing your story and some of the insights today it was a pleasure having you on the show my pleasure thanks for having me thanks so much